the next session, I, I think, is uh, a session that's really going to open your minds as to what can be achieved through diet. It's a session on nutritional ketosis by none other than Jimmy Moore. So earlier today, I told you my story and a little bit about the work that I do. I wanted to tell you about something I've been doing this year that I think is really exciting, could definitely help a lot of people. Not saying it's necessarily for everyone, but it certainly has helped Jimmy more. Um, and we'll talk about that here. So that's before and after that I talked to you about earlier. Fat guy, much less fat guy. So you might be thinking, in the nine years since you lost all that weight on your New Year's resolution, everything's just been peachy keen. No problems whatsoever, right? Everything was good. Uh, not exactly. In 2006, I started putting back on some weight. 15 pounds put me back to 111 kilos. 2007, another 15 pounds went back on my body to get me up to 118 kilos. 2008, 15 more pounds to get to up to 275. And you might be thinking to yourself, um, hello, McFly, are you going to do something about that? <laughs> right? The problem was I was. I was trying hard to do the same things that had worked for me in 2004, but suddenly they weren't working for me. Flash forward 2009, another 15 pounds, and now it's getting serious because in poundage, I'm getting ready to see a three in front of my weight again. Not fun. Over the past couple of years, 10 more pounds, I did hit the big three over uh, 300 pound mark and ugh is all I have to say about that. So as you can see, 15 pounds, 15 pounds, it adds up fast. Needless to say, I was quite frustrated and so let's take a look at early 2012. I was at a paleo conference of all things called Paleo FX. It was just under 300 pounds, 136 kilos. That's not a happy man. This was me on the, again, ir irony of all ironies, the low carb cruise, and I was over 300 pounds. And Rod, you still invited me to come speak. <laughs> so there's a picture of my wife. Hey, and for the first time doing this slide, it actually fit on the slide. It, it's jumped off every time I've given this talk. Uh, that's a picture Christine took with her iPhone right before the low carb cruise and I was 306.1 pounds, 139 kilos. Again, I'm smiling, but I'm just not happy. This is how I felt. Anybody been there? Did somebody just do the job of the hut sound? <laughs> That's good. So you might be wondering, how in the world could something like this happen on a you know, good low carb, high fat diet? You know, it, it worked for you before, Jimmy. Why didn't it work now? This is the book that kind of changed things around for me, and I highly recommend you get it. What's funny is um, the two guys that wrote it, Dr. Jeff Folick and Dr. Steve Finney, two of the world-renowned researchers of carbohydrate-restricted diets, they wrote it for like people that exercise as a performance book. It, it wasn't really for people desiring weight loss or anything like that, but there was a little section in there that I've just, it's rocked my world, uh, which we'll be talking about. So a couple of years ago, I started this concept of N equals one on my blog. N equals one is simply you're doing an experiment on one person, and I'm that one person. So when I first started doing it, people were like, you know, I wonder if that, that, that low-carb bread is good. So I'm like, okay, I'll test it on myself. I'll post the results on my blog, test my blood glucose and all that. And by the way, don't eat low-carb bread. It's, no. Same with the Atkins bars, those kind of, it's just garbage. So I already had this in place, so when I saw this concept that I'm going to tell you about nutritional ketosis, I thought, hey, N equals 1. So I began my journey right after the low-carb cruise, weighed 306 pounds, and I began testing May the 15th. It is different than the urine ketone test. How many in here have, like, peed on a stick and that tells you if it's pink or purple and, yeah. I hate to break it to you, but those are not very accurate, and we'll talk about that. I got a precision extra um, meter. I think I left it down there, Chris. Can you bring that? Um, 
Uh, here in Australia, it's called the Freestyle Optium. And it's basically a blood ketone meter. Yeah, just bring the whole back, Christine. So my first reading, it was supposed to be between 0.5 and 3.0. It was 0.3. Now again, thought I had been eating, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thought I had been eating a really good high fat, low carb diet. 0.3 told me, eh eh. The urine ketone measures a specific ketone, uh, the ketone strips measures a specific ketone called acetoacetate, but the blood ketone measures beta hydroxybutyrate. The beta hydroxybutyrate is the one you want to measure. And again, I thought I was eating a good high fat, low carb diet. So here are my three tools. I, obviously, a bathroom scale. But remember what I said about if you're a bathroom scale whore, don't stand on that thing every day if it might makes you, whoop, makes you uh, fail in your attempts. The other thing is this blood ketone meter. It looks kind of like a blood glucose meter. I will actually do a demonstration on stage here in a minute if I don't throw them all over rod again. And then a blood glucose monitor, which this also doubles as a blood glucose, but it's a lot easier to have two different ones uh, especially when you're testing as much as I am. So what am I looking for? Obviously body weight changes, but that's really, to me, the least significant of all of it. Body weight changes is kind of a side effect of eating healthy. So I'm marking it down, but I'm not as interested in body weight as I am these other things. Blood sugar changes, that's a key. Blood ketone changes. Uh, how many have heard of Rob Wolf? So his favorite phrase is, you know, how do you look, feel, and perform? So the, the health trifecta from Rob Wolf. Intangibles like sleep, we just heard lots about. Body fat loss, muscle growth, exercise performance, et cetera. And then literally just observing everything about what's going on in my health. So this is from the Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance book. As you can see, nutritional ketosis actually begins at 0.5 millimolar. So you'll get that measurement on the blood ketone. And then optimal is anywhere between that 0.5 and 3.0. Now you may see a couple of things that might scare you, the starvation ketosis and ketoacidosis. If you're a type one diabetic, then ketoacidosis is certainly you need to be very conscious of. If you're not, you're not gonna get ketones that high. Now the highest I've gotten is 6.7 during my six months experiment so far. Um, and trust me, I was not starving when I got that 6.7. In fact, I was just uh, a couple of days ago, what was it, Christine, 5.6 or 4? 5.4, a couple of days ago. I've had trouble getting my ketones high enough here in this country, but I think it's just the stress of travel and everything. All right, so I'm gonna talk about five low-carb mistakes that I made that nutritional ketosis helped to fix. So uh, a show of hands, how many think that's a pretty good low-carb meal? Raise your hand. It's not a trick question. Okay, wow, most of the room. Eh, maybe not. Mistake number one, I was consuming too much protein. And a lot of people think a low carb diet is a high protein diet. Why, we're not giving, getting that message rammed down our throats every day, are we? That high protein Atkins paleo diet. Well, the truth is a well formulated low carb diet is once high in fat. And you know, we, we've seen that over and over again and through a process known as gluconeogenesis, don't let that word scare you away, but it ba basically means your uh, excessive protein is turned to sugar uh, in the body through the liver. And so if you're eating a lot of chicken breasts, which is what was on that previous picture, you know, where's the fat, right? So lean meats like chicken or turkey are probably not the best choice for your protein. Try to get the fattier cuts of meat, and again, you got the bomb diggity foods here. You need to be eating them. So, glad to make you laugh. So the uh, absolute amount of protein during this experiment, I have been limiting, and this might seem low because I'm a tall, broad shouldered guy, 80 to 100 grams of protein. That amounts to about 12% of my total calories. The 100 is probably the days that I do lifting, 80 uh, is when I'm not lifting. So again, this is an archaic way to measure, blood, or measure ketones because that was mistake number two I was relying on those sticks to tell me if I was doing well or not. And the problem with the urine sticks is if you're dehydrated, you're gonna have a really high concentration of acetoacetate. And if you've drank all day, 
guess what? It's going to be diluted. So it's really hard unless you're just sitting there just measuring out how much water you're having. Okay, waited enough time. Okay, now I'll test. And no, it's just, it's horrible. And unfortunately, uh, they're just not as accurate as having a meter that gives you a number. So measuring blood ketones will determine whether you're burning fat or not. And again, the Freestyle Optium here in Australia is a very reliable meter. Now, the cool thing is, again, Australia has an advantage over the United States. Your meter uh, strips, the strips is where they get you. Your strips are less than a dollar a piece. In America, one strip is $6. So enjoy. And yes, I've, I've stocked up a little bit while I've been here. <laughs> so here's another message. And if you haven't heard this one yet, then you haven't been listening today. But fat does not make you fat. So let's please stop with the fat phobia. And that was mistake number three. And really not so much for me being afraid of fat, but maybe I didn't realize I need a lot more fat than even what I was consuming. But you know, the low-fat propaganda has totally ruined us. You know, everybody they say, okay, if low-carb is good, then low-carb, low-fat must be better. I thought that at one time. Got over that real fast, by the way. So when you cut the fat, you have the cravings and the hunger hits you really hard. But there's really no harm in ramping up your fat. And right now, I am eating a diet that consists of 85% of my calories from fat. I know that sounds, <gasps> but I'm going to show you how I do it here in a minute. It's naturally high fat foods to help get you into ketosis because people say, well, cut your carbs, you get into ketosis. Cutting your carbs is one aspect of it, but getting the fat high enough is the rest of it. So let's take a look at some of those foods. Anybody eat these? Raise your hand if you eat these. Awesome. Of course you do. You've got a million of them out there. <laughs> you don't have to drive 25 miles to the store to find them. How about this, people that uh, can ha handle that? Okay, good. How about some pastured eggs? Mm-hmm, we're gonna show you my meal here in a minute from uh, Melbourne the other day. Coconut oil? Yeah. Bacon! That was the most exciting thing at the Ancestral Health Symposium when uh, Matt Lalonde gave a talk and said, bacon's like one of the most nutritionally greatest things you could eat. And like, yeah! <laughs> now, if you can handle dairy, sour cream? How about grass-fed beef? Cheddar cheese, or really any hard cheese. Don't buy American cheese. That crap is nasty. <laughs> Coconut. Yay. Yay. Dark chocolate. Good stearic acid. Cream cheese and liquid fish oil. All of those are really good sources of fat. So here is a meal that I actually made at Rod's house a couple weeks ago. And it's uh, keto eggs brekkie. Uh, so I had... Uh, what was it, three eggs cooked in two tablespoons of butter, and I put in three ounces of some kind of hard cheese, I don't know, it was good, <laughs> and three tablespoons of sour cream on top. Now, if I was at home in South Carolina, I would have added some sauerkraut for the fermented foods. I would have had a whole avocado with that. I don't know why, oh yeah, the avocados weren't ripe, that's why I didn't eat it with this. Um, a whole lot of avocado, and then some high fat like meat, so, a sausage or something like that. One meal. <laughs> Low carb does not mean a free for all. It doesn't mean you just go hog wild and eat a steak like that. And that was mistake number four. I was eating too much and too often. So people often ask, do you need to count your calories when you eat a low carb diet? Well, yes and no. When you eat something, uh, you want it to make you fulfilled, right? You want to eat so you don't have to be hungry again. Well, when you're keto adapted, those calories will drop naturally. I had my brekkie this morning around 7.15, and I've not eaten again yet. How many of you had lunch? How many of you skipped lunch? Two of us. <laughs> because when you're fully keto adapted, and I'm going to show you my numbers here in a minute, you don't really think about food. And, and it's a beautiful thing. Hunger's completely gone. You really fast for many hours because you're being fueled by ketones. Currently, my uh, dietary intake of carbohydrates is about 3% of my calories, and I've been spontaneously doing this thing called intermittent fasting, upwards of 12 to 24 hours. 
there's really no need to have this whole meal, snack, meal, snack. Me I mean, who came up with that? They should be shot. So the, the cool thing is, uh, here's a sidebar on, on intermittent fasting. It's also called IFing if you start doing some Google searches or things like that. So it happens naturally. You know, don't force it. Trust me. I was one of those people that if I, it, you say fast, I was running for the kitchen and getting food so I'd have enough in my body so I would, I'm not fasting. It just sounded t terrible. But if you're hungry, you're, that's your clue to eat something. And right now, if I was hungry, I'd be like, see y'all, I'm going to go get something to eat. But I'm not hungry. The key there is to make sure you're consuming enough fat and total calories so you can enable it to happen. So this morning, my breakfast was uh, similar to the one you saw a while ago, and I'm fine, completely fine. So if you want to learn more about intermittent fasting, there are a lot of great experts out there, Brad Pilon, John Berardi, Dr. Joe Mercola, and of course, Rob Wolf. The key is be patient with yourself. Don't let this derail you. You don't have to force the issue. If you want to eat three meals a day, go for it, but just know that fasting period is going to help you build more ketones to fuel your body. Anybody been there? Blood glucose been so low? <laughs> and that was mistake number five. I was failing to properly stabilize my blood sugar. So you might be wondering, what in the world does blood glucose have to do with nutritional ketosis and blood ketones? Well, I've noticed during my experiment that when my blood sugar has been higher, my blood ketones have been lower, and the inverse. When blood ketones have been higher, like that, time, that day that we had the 5.4 reading, my blood sugar was like four, which is 73 in my terms. So everyone really needs to own a glucometer. If you don't have one now, it is an invaluable thing. And it's not just for diabetics. I mean, people ask me all the time, why do I need a glucometer? I'm not diabetic. I'm like, you need it. You need to know where you stand. It definitely gives you a lot of good information. So your fasting blood sugar levels should be between four and five here in Australia. Raising your blood ketone levels um, over 2.0, uh, I've noticed for me anyway, this is again N equals one, I've noticed that I have a dramatic shift downward at that point in my blood sugar. No hunger, improved mood, I don't, I, do I look like I'm unhappy right now? Okay, yeah. And a good sense of well being. Uh, so the key here, lower but not low blood sugar. You definitely want, don't want hypoglycemia, and I have not experienced any of that since I've been here or since I've been in nutritional ketosis. Plus higher ketones, that's definitely the sweet spot that you're looking for. So you might want to take that exit. So you might be wondering, okay, that's all well and good, but what kind of weight and health changes have you seen doing this over the past six months? So let's take a look at some random observations. It took me four days to get into nutritional ketosis. So officially it was like 0.6 by day four. Volick and Finney say it can take upwards of two to four weeks, so definitely be patient with yourself if you're not there. I've remained in this state uh, pretty much ever since. I, I think on the flight here, I lost a lot of ketones because my first reading was like 0.6, and I'm used to like three point something. I was like, uh, but blood ketones have risen as high as 6.4, consuming a fat protein carb ratio of 85, 12, 3, but the, you know, right here, not everyone needs to do that. I'm doing an, an experiment to show what can happen. Definitely, I mean, find the carb tolerance that's right for you. Find what works for you. You may be able to do, say, a 70, you know, 17, and I can't do the math, but you figure it out. Figure out what works for you. And don't get so caught up on the macronutrient ratios. Just eat real food and be cognizant of how specific foods affect you. And I am trying to eat the best quality foods. Uh, my paleo friends... Uh, often say, well, it's all about the quality, and it is. But for some people, it's also about the, the macronutrient you have to be careful with, and, and that's a good thing. So again, the IF started spontaneously. I have been drinking a lot of water, doing my regular supplements, although interesting kind of sidebar here in Australia. I said, you know what? I'm going to just live on the food while I'm here and get the vitamin D from your wonderful sunshine, ozone uh, layer uh, sunshine there. I've done well. It's, it's been awesome. Uh, so I've had zero hunger, zero cravings, completely satisfied. I used to struggle with that sleep thing. Four to five hours a night, I was having trouble earlier this year. Started doing this, and once I got ketones to a certain level, 
I'm regularly sleep, sleeping seven to nine hours a night. Thinking clearer than ever before. Ever before. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that was a bad time to do a faux pas. <laughs> Ketone power, baby. Pimple and acne breaks at, breakouts have greatly reduced. So I used to get bad pimples in this T area, and I'm almost 41, and why am I still getting pimples? Well, not anymore. Anybody get those skin tags, those little annoying little skin tags? Mine are all shriveling up. They're going away. And you can thank Melbourne for this next point. Everybody wanted to know how my poop was doing, and yes, it's doing quite well, thank you very much. Very regular, and there's no abnormalities there. And I am wearing clothes today that I have not worn in five years. In fact, since I've been in Australia, I'm now on my last loop, and this, these things, uh, they're, I'm like having to you know, try to keep them up. Happy days are here again. So let's get into some of the numbers, because th this is kind of interesting. This is a graph of my blood ketones, my most recent one in the sixth month. In the morning time, the blood ketones are always going to be pretty much generally the lowest of the day. So as you can see, it kind of varies around there, but the average is about 2.1 millimolar in the mornings. So here's my nighttime ones. And again, it's kind of varies, but, but the average is higher. You'll see it's almost it's exactly double, 4.2 millimolar. So you're gonna have higher readings at night, lower readings in the morning. So if you start doing this, you just need to be aware of this, that you're gonna have the lowest reading of the day in the morning and tend to have a uh, highest reading either after a really strong workout or at night. Um, coming up in the next few months, I'm gonna do like an every hour on the hour for a week while I'm awake. Obviously, if I'm asleep, I'm not gonna be pricking myself, but um, just to see kind of what it does throughout the day, that'd be fun. All right, so speaking of pricking myself, let me do that for you. I'm gonna set the mic down. Oh, does somebody faint inside of us? <laughs> no faint. No faint. Oh, that's blood ketone good. Accidentally at one of these places did blood glucose monitor. Sometimes. All right, so this is what freaks a lot of people out. It's just the pricking your fingers, but you just do it and just, there it is. All right, so we're gonna get it in there. Anybody wanna take a prediction as to what you think my uh, blood ketones are? Oh, y'all are like making high. All right, so my blood sugar was 82, which is um, four, and it's 2.1. He said 2.2. <laughs> you dirty dog. Of course, he's seen me do this at every event, so. So as you can see, that was real easy, right? And 2.1, and if I can get my clicker here. What I like to have is right around 2.0 or higher. I'm there, baby. Because I tend to feel best at that level. And again, this might be a variable thing for you that you might feel good at you know, 1.0. But for me, I tend to feel better at the 2.0. So uh, Christine had to remind me to test my blood sugar, so uh, put a lot of, I'm just kidding. So blood sugar, let's take a look at that. When I first started this, this was back the very first month that I tested, you can see my blood sugar was getting up there. It did start to come down, and then I had some issues, but pretty much it averaged upper 90s, low 100s. What's that, like 5, 5.5 5 or something like that? It, it was getting up there. And that's fasting, of course. Here's my latest one. It's come way down, October to November, upper 70s, low 80s, right around 4 to 4.5. Love it. Now, I will let you know, I took this supplement for about three months to help lower my blood uh, glucose numbers, but since I've been here, I haven't taken it at all, and my average since I've been here has is, is easily been like right around 4.0. So I don't need it anymore. So I uh, went to the doctor and he saw a number on the wall. 
That's your cholesterol. <gasps> so in uh, the United States, they have this uh, customized test called an NMR lipo profile test. It's only done in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, which I'm very fortunate to live like three hours from. And I had one run on 1025. It's going to get a little geeky, so stick with me. HDLC, which you guys can have run, uh, was 65, 1.7, uh, which is pretty good. Anything over 1.3 is, is outstanding. Triglycerides were 46, which 0.5. Really, really, is that, is that low? Is that good? Okay. <laughs> so anything under 1.1 is stellar. Now here's one that you can't have run here. It's small LDLP, um, and I'll explain that in a minute. But of the 3,451 LDL particles, only 221 of them were the small LDL, which means only 6% were the bad kind, or another way to look at it, 94% are the large fluffy kind that you want. Now there are questions about this whole you know, LDLP, and you guys can run an APOB, um, and whether it matters uh, for people eating a low-carb diet. So anybody heard of Peter Atia? The used to be called War on Insulin blog. Now it's Eating Academy, and he's the guy behind Nusi. Um, he had an uh, Australian write to him on his blog recently about, well, I can't get an LDLP. What do I get? And he recommended getting an APOB. Now I was talking to Rod earlier today. I think there's like you said six centers. Uh, that can have that run. So definitely ask your doctor or ask around and see if you can get that run um, because it's a good proxy for the LDLP. So here are some more changes that happen. Total cholesterol, and this will freak out a lot of doctors, 9.3 millimolar. <gasps> and LDL is 7.4 of that. Um, and these are very high looking. And, and most doctors would look at that and say, you need to be on statin. But here's my question. You saw all those great numbers before with the HDL and the triglycerides. How is it possible to simultaneously have those kind of great numbers and then have concerning lipid numbers on the other flip side? So how can I have great heart health with certain numbers and then not great heart health with the other? I, I really want to know the answer to that question. That's what happened when I told the nurse about my cholesterol. She fainted. Okay. So here's some more food for thought, too, while we're on this subject. My current A1C, anybody know what an A1C is? A few of you. So it's kind of an average blood glucose reading for the past three months. It's measured again with a blood test. It was 4.5, which is really good. In fact, the person that tested it, they said they've never seen anybody with that good of an A1C. My latest CT heart scan, so I can get a, a CT scan of your chest, showed zero calcium buildup. My triglyceride to HDL ratio is, is uh, microscopic 0.7. Really think anything under 4.0 is, is good. My insulin resistance score, this is one that was on my NMR lipo profile test, was 11. Anything under 45 is amazing. This was a fun one. VLDL came back as too low to measure. You don't want VLDL, and it was too low to measure. And uh, you heard about C-reactive protein earlier today. Uh, mine was only 0.7, which really anything under point or 1.0 is good. So you might be thinking, okay, this is all great, but what are you going to do about those funky cholesterol questions? So I've been asked to write a book um, about this, uh, and I'm going to, I know a few people I can interview and <laughs> talk to them and try to figure out what all this means and put it into a kind of a layman's book, um, kind of tentatively titled uh, A Layman's Perspective on Understanding uh, Your Cholesterol Test Results. Hope to have it out in the fall of 2013. It's, uh, I don't know if it's going to be here or not, but I'm going to make sure it's here if, uh, if it's not. But we're going to have each chapter will deal with, with one of these cholesterol uh, numbers because people are confused. Are you confused about your cholesterol? I mean, it's really hard when you hear all these negative messages about, well, LDL is the only thing you matter, but your HDL needs to be good, but your triglycerides. It's just woo woo. So we're gonna to try to bring some clarity to that. But here's a novel concept that I wish more medical professionals would start to embrace in their interaction with patients. How about we start treating actual disease rather than risk factors? Because really at the end of the day, all these little numbers with the blood, it's risk factors is all we're testing for. We're not actually testing actual disease. So here's a lady, her routine for lifting weights each day is 
is an hour and a half, 15 minutes of cardio, 15 minutes of weightlifting, and an hour to work up the gumption to do it. So here's what's happened with my exercise routine. This has been really the most exciting part for me. I held off on doing really any intense exercise until I got into a really good state of nutritional ketosis. It took me about four months. I wanted to be fully keto adapted, have regular readings like you just saw of 2.0 uh, blood ketones. But I was already noticing around month two and a half, three, that my energy was just like coming through. It's like, okay, I know when I get to the gym, it's gonna be awesome. Now, I used to get some really bad hypoglycemia. And has anybody ever experienced that? You know, you'd eat and you'd start getting dizzy. And if you lift weights, it was horrid. And so I was a little skittish, to be honest with you. I had a lot of this kind of stuff going on. Not fun. So I was eating low carb all these years, and unfortunately it was not helping me in my performance. I tried adding in some high sugar fruit to try to help. I tried adding in some starchy carbs before and after workouts. At varying times, nothing was helping with this. It was a short-term solution, but it didn't solve the problem. So attempting to lift an exercise in a fasted state, I was like, are you nuts? Yeah, it sounded like pure torture. Plus, I had trouble recovering upwards of seven to 10 days between workouts because my muscles would be so sore. Now, that man over there, where'd he go? Uh, gave me a workout a couple of days ago, so I'm a little sore right now, but not nearly like I would have been uh, before. <laughs> so how did it go being in nutritional ketosis? No, thankfully, I did not look like that guy. Now, here's some interesting information from the Volokh and Finney book. Your glycogen tank only gives you about 2,000 calories worth of energy. But if you're keto adapted and you're tapping into your fat stores, guess what? You get 40,000 plus calories of energy. And that's of a lean person. I got a little more than 40,000 on my body. So what I committed to doing was every three days, a you know, very heavy weightlifting session uh, which amounted to about two 30-minute uh, high-intensity weightlifting sessions, I was very skeptical because I knew about the negative side effects I had had before. And I wanted to put it to the ultimate test by doing it in a fasted state of at least 18 to 24 hours. So, all right, ketones, let's see how good you are. Am I crazy? Uh, yeah. Not as crazy as that baby. So here's what happened. No dizziness no blackouts, no fatigue or weakness, robust energy, no hunger or craving, surprisingly full strength, invigorating post-workout feeling, and quick muscle recovery. All that was foreign to me. It totally took me by surprise. I, if you'd have told me that that's what would have happened, I would have not believed you because of all my past experiences. And I have gotten stronger and stronger. We'll see that here in a minute. Strength gains are much more interesting to me, and I kind of feel like Superman, because <laughs> I'm fueled by ketones, baby. Sorry, you might be thinking, okay, all that's great, but what about the weight and fat loss you've experienced on nutritional ketosis? I'm so glad you asked. This is the six months since I started, when I was at 306 pounds right after the low-carb cruise. Yeah, not fun. Now I'm a lot less. But you might notice it's not a straight linear line. It's the and that's normal. There's nothing wrong with that. People think, oh, if I, if I gained one pound today, oh my gosh, I'm such a failure, I'm gonna go eat carbs. Go ahead, knock yourself out, but you're just sabotaging what the body naturally needs to do. The trend line's good though, right? I fully in, intend to see that continue. Oh, by the way, I had a, a sound for you. Please, I'm sexy and I know it. <laughs> so you might be thinking, and I know you are, some of you are, some of you exercise guys out there, you're eating 12% protein. You can't possibly be losing fat. It has to be a lot of muscle. I'm glad you asked. I think I could take her. <laughs> so there is this uh, technology called a DEXA scan and I'm gonna show you a picture of it here in a minute, but it measures the amount of lean muscle mass and body fat. Um, and after four months being on this, I had one run 
on September the 13th. I did a follow-up on right the, the day before we uh, flew to Australia to see what kind of changes happened in that two-month period. Um, I want to thank Dr. Jeffrey Galvin, who provided this to me for free. Um, but that's what it looks like. It basically is a fax machine of your body, so you lay down flat, and it's like, and it just kind of does your whole body. So let's take a look at those results, and it's going to be a little bit funky on this next slide, but I'll try to interpret on the next one for you. So that's the results of it, uh, which will show you kind of the two readings um, and then where uh, all the, the changes happened in different part of the body. So let's translate that for you. So again, this is September 2012 to November 2012. I lost 9.7 pounds, which is about, about four and a half kilos, four kilos of net weight loss. Of that, 5% of it was body fat loss, which is huge to lose that much body fat in two months. 16.26 pounds of body fat loss was that seven and a half kilos. Now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, 9.7 and you lost 16 pounds. You put on muscle. Why, yes, I did. Three kilos worth of muscle in two months, 6.19 pounds. Now, remember, protein of 12% didn't eat any carbohydrates before or after working out. So let's take a look at quickly where those fat losses and muscle gains happened. As you can see, it was pretty uh, varied. It was kind of all over the place. I'd lose pretty good chunk of pounds in fat from various places and then put on even more muscle in those same places that I lost fat. I thought you couldn't lose fat and gain muscle at the same time. Yeah, you can. And I do in intend for that to continue as I keep doing this. All right, so where do I go from here with this experiment? I've done it for six months. I plan on doing it for another six, another six months. I'm just gonna stay the course. It's not, it ain't broke, don't fix it, is a common phrase we use, and we're gonna keep doing it. Helping others do their own nutritional ketosis experiments. So people have been writing me since hearing me do this talk and, and writing about it on my blog, and all right, am I doing this right? I'm, we'll help you out. I want to help provide resources to arm you with good information. Um, this is by no means a, okay, this is like the next big thing. No, I'm just saying this is what's happening for me. It might help you as well. Interestingly, my cholesterol book publisher is already interested in a book about this subject. So I'm like, let me write the cholesterol one first, and then I'll write a book uh, if it continues to be good about nutritional ketosis. I'll continue tracking everything that I'm doing but I'm also going to ask my uh, readers to submit, and, and I'm asking you too, you know, any tests that you think I should run. And we'll consider those depending on the amount of money that it costs out of my pocket to do. Um, and I'm also at the end of this thinking of giving all the raw data to some researcher to maybe do a case study that would be published in a medical journal. But more than anything, I really want to see for myself and show others that eating this way is not just some crazy diet because if you tell people you're eating at 85% you know, diet of fat, they will think you're pretty crazy. But I'm hopefully showing that it can be implemented in a sustainable way. And I may not need to stay at 85 forever. The more I'm doing this, you know, I threw in some strawberries a couple weeks ago, and the next morning my ketones went up. I fully intended them to go down, but they went up. So you can keep up with all of my updates at the Live and La Vida Low Carb blog. Click on the N equals one tab at the top, you'll see all of them. And that's how you can find me, or you can just Google Jimmy Moore. I'm, I'm, all those should be on the front page. And thank you very much.